welcome to Bloomfield Cups Chico. Hey, we've got a nice small group, so we'll get to uh, pick uh, Kelly's brain really intimately. That'll be nice. So, as you know, One Million Cups is a community that supports entrepreneurs. It takes a million cups of coffee to get through an idea and to get the support you need to launch it. So, this is a, a free event for the community. It's put on by volunteers and sponsors, so thanks to Garden Villa Cafe for letting us have this lovely evening. And uh, Chico Start, our startup incubator. Uh, Chamber of Commerce. And uh, Danny Schwartz Consulting. So those are our those are the main sponsors, and we have a, a whole bunch of organizers who volunteer their time to put this on each week. So thank you for doing that. There are over 160 cities in the United States that do one thing every single week. Communities range from five people sometimes to 350 one time in North Dakota. So, uh, so we have a huge opportunity to grow our to grow this event, and we would love your support in finding those hidden entrepreneurs and startups. Give them a chance to pitch their idea for six minutes in front of community of peers, mentors, investors, and um, after six minute pitch, there's 20 minutes of question and answer. We also invite business leaders to come and uh, talk about their stories and experiences so we can learn from them. So if you have, know people that would be interested in doing that as well, we, we typically try to do those uh, once a month. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Kelly Graves, who is our speaker today. He's going to be talking about his experiences and hopefully give us some nuggets of wisdom. He has uh, helped businesses like Build.com and Amy Hobbies to get through some um, strategic challenges, I would say. So, welcome, Kelly. Thank you, it's good to be here. Nice meeting some new people this morning. I'm gonna talk about a little bit about myself and then I'm gonna tell a story. I think we learn best through stories rather than a top 10 list on leadership and uh, talk to you about uh, some successes and then obviously some failures. So uh, let me see, I started out doing consulting um, about 20 years ago and what started for me was based on a need. I had owned my own business, I'd been a general manager of a business and the challenges that I saw in business were not so much about investment capital or profit margins and those are important but they weren't the core issues. I'm really big on getting past the symptoms and getting really to the core issues. And uh, what I kept noticing was the people issue, the trust issue. Everything done in business is done with and through people. So even if we have two accountants or two people writing program, it's still about their interaction on how they really get along and develop new ideas and are able to brainstorm. So I went back to grad school at the age of 38, got my master's in organizational psychology, started my consulting business and I do everything from strategic planning. Um, the planning part is easy. I, I do a lot of leadership development. The big thing is the implementation. Most companies that I go into, 90, 95% will have a business plan, but they don't consistently implement it. So I'm big on the implementation piece. I'd like to tell you a story now about a company I worked with about uh, seven or eight years ago. And uh, it was a company down in the Bay Area and uh, let me see, background, they were about $37 million company, 95 people, third, no, second generation with this company, and um, three brothers who hated each other. And that's one of the reasons why I was brought in, as I do a lot with conflict and how to help people overcome conflict, uh, partnerships, family dynamics. And uh, this, one, this one was my Everest. Um, when I, when I first met them, we were at a, in a conference room and they were literally yelling and screaming at each other and apparently they did that quite often. And so that was the first hurdle. The second hurdle was uh, it was an aging manufacturing team and there's nothing wrong with a mature team. The problem with this one, however, is most of them had been there for 20, 30, some of them 38, 40 years and had grown up with the brothers that were running the company. And because of this, when I sat in on my first executive meeting, they would talk about topics, but they wouldn't make a decision. And you probably experienced this. They'll talk about you know, a topic, they should be making a decision about here, 
and they would jump to the next topic because the, the stress gets high and then they don't want to make a decision. Um, and that was one of the problems with this company and the CEO had a lot of anxiety, had depression, and mainly it stemmed from uh, things not getting done. So anyway, uh, let me see, talked about the, oh, and then, oh, there was an aging manufacturing plant. And so with this plant, it was about 60 years old and uh, the, the manufacturing facility, a lot of the equipment to make the parts were mm, 30, 40, 50 years old. And so they just kept pouring oil in the machines. And so we had a problem where um, things were just put off consistently. Let me take a drink of water here. Things were put off consistently. So when I sat in on about the third meeting, I think it was, um, I saw them try to make a decision and they wouldn't do it, they wouldn't do it. And I was sitting there telling the CEO, make a decision, and he just couldn't make the decision. And this seems odd, but the reason why I bring this up is I run into this quite often where a company will, um, people won't be able to make the decision. They'll talk about it, but they just won't be able to do it. So I said, okay, what's something that you guys have tried to do for the last, say, seven, eight years? And something simple. And so they came up with, we have been trying to clean the yard for about 10 years. We, we always put it out as an objective to do, but we can never get around doing it. And after 60 years, it'd just clutter. And so I said, okay, this is what we're gonna do. In the next 20 minutes, I want you to come up with the plan to clean the yard, the day you're gonna do it, between now and next Thursday at 8 a.m. when we meet. I want you to figure out whose equipment, which department is gonna supply the equipment, who's gonna supply the manpower, and then come up and you've got 20 minutes to figure all this out. Seems pretty basic, right? At 10 minutes, I said, okay, you've got 10 minutes left. And they go, we need a little bit more. I said, no, you got 10 minutes, you know? And so they start talking a little bit more and, and going through the process. And I said, okay, you've got six minutes, four minutes, two minutes, and now they're freaking out. And I said, make the decision. I don't care if it's the wrong decision, make the decision. So they finally do it after a lot of, uh, you know, pulling teeth and, uh, so next Thursday they came in and they were giddy. They were like schoolboys that just won their first baseball game. They had finally set a goal, achieved the goal and completed it. And so we just, we discussed, you know, debriefed how to do that. And uh, they did really well. So the last area that I want to talk about with this is the, the anxiety and the uh, depression that the owner went through. The more often that we created a good, uh, we, we made decisions and we completed them, the better that he got in terms of his anxiety. His anxiety started, um, you, know, uh, you know, going away. And uh, so that's where that is. I think one of the challenges in consistently in companies where I mess up is companies that are having challenges, there's never enough time, never enough money, and I get caught up in that. And I don't take the time to talk about the white elephant in the corner that I should. And that's really the value as leaders and as consultants is we need to be talking about that white elephant in the corner, the topic that everybody knows about but doesn't want to talk about. And that's really the value of you as a leader is how do we bring up these things and talk about them um, and then you know, kind of ruffle the feathers but are able to put the pieces of the project or the team back together. I think that's probably the biggest thing. That's uh, what I see where the biggest problems are in, uh, in leadership. And so I wanted to make this really short. And uh, so that's, that's it. That's about all I had to say. I don't know if that's too long or too short. Um, yeah. So what, you said you were, had a business before. Mm -hmm. What did you do? I owned a car lot. Okay. I was raised in the car business. My uh, father and uncle both had car lots. So I uh, owned a car lot. Yeah. How did you get clients like Alien Hobbies and Build.com? Was it from relationship building? Mm -hmm. you... Yeah, pretty much everything is the relationship building, um, referrals. I get a few from a website and advertising, but very, very few. So, uh, yeah, I met uh, Chris Friedland, and uh, he had some challenges back about, I don't know, 12 years ago, and so I uh, worked with him and his executive team. and. Uh, then I met uh, Kendall Bennett, the owner of A-Main Hobbies, and 
you know, they were having some cha challenges. They went from a small company to a large company. They went from basically a garage to about 100 employees in seven years. So just huge growing pains. And uh, one of the challenges there, without giving too much you know, confidential information, is you know, when you grow that fast, you have people that are, um, that are in management positions. And they can do a great job when you've got six people or 12 people or 20 people, but when you get into that next level where they really have to run the department on their own and make firm decisions and are able to be real managers instead of just, I've been the longest person here, been here the longest, where you can actually make decisions and get the best out of your people. And that was really the challenges that we had there. And then putting structure to the meetings, um, helping them make decisions, and then a big one, make a strategic plan and then follow through on that strategic plan. I think that's probably the biggest that I see. I was working with a college um, a dozen years ago and uh, Jose, the president, and I were talking and one of our earlier conversations and he's saying, you know, gosh, we've got this great strategic plan. We've been working on it for a year. He showed me it was beautifully done. And I said, that's great, Jose. What do you plan on doing it? And he goes, I don't know. And really, I mean, it seems crazy that they would put you know, maybe $100,000 into this, but yet they didn't really have a plan on how they were gonna implement it on a consistent basis. And I can't tell you the, the companies that I run into where they don't have consistent plans. They'll have plans, but not consistent. And then there won't be a direct line between the organizational goals, the department goals, and then each individual's goals within that department on how they're gonna follow through on that. So. Well, most of the time, companies are in firefighting mode, yeah. Oh, yeah. and so, right, yeah, and so that's usually what happens, and some of them even plan on putting a strategic plan together, and either they don't know how, or it just never comes up. They, you know, it's always going to be next month or next year, January, um, and so that's the biggest, the biggest um, issue, and then again, how do we really implement and how do we get people's behaviors to change? You know, it's one thing to have, you know, the beauty in our head or on paper, but, you know, the key to leadership and organizational development is behavior change and then culture change. And that's where you people usually fall short. Um, yeah. Have you um, had to advise board of directors? Pardon? Board, a board of directors? Yeah. Yeah, I've worked with uh, two boards of directors. Yeah, um, let me see. The, okay, the first one that I worked with was for a nonprofit. And um, let me see, they were, they were scattered. They didn't have a real vision for the organization. Again, it was, we have pain come in. And so I was working with the, with the leadership uh, and the CEO on how she could improve but the board was scattered as well. And so getting them to say, okay, what are our objectives? What's realistic? What's a realistic time frame? How are we gonna do that? Um, what leaders or directors or managers do we have on the team and what do they need to do to improve so we can actually implement this? And so just you know, starting out with a clear goal and vision, making it realistic, a lot of companies will uh, or even departments, they try to bite off too much instead of, you know, let's, you know, let's do these 20 things. I go, no, 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 let's do three things and push those three things a mile down the road instead of 20 things, you know, three inches. So uh, anyway, that was my first one with a board. Was that like a board retreat that you were? Mm, I never did retreats, not with that organization. I've done a lot of retreats with the team, but not the board. Okay. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, I've done the team building and I've done um, a lot of retreats with, you know, the executive teams. Um, yeah, boards are the same thing. You know, you just have to really, you know, they're just looking at, at the bigger picture, you know, where are we going as an organization? And then it's up to the CEO or the president to say, okay, let's make that more granular. And how do we actually um, implement those ideas? Yeah. Questions? In your experience, um what is that that moment? So a lot of times, you know, if business is struggling, teams are struggling, mm -hmm. maybe profits aren't doing that well, so they don't want to hire somebody. So mm -hmm. they can't afford, they feel like they can't afford to hire somebody to fix the problems. So right. In order to bring in a consultant in, they're committing to paying to fix some issues. So right. how do they get from that point to deciding, okay, 
it's usually too late. Or it's it, it is usually too late. Statistically, it's seven or more years. And I, I mean, that's what the books will tell you. In my experience, it's been sometimes a generation. You know, I mean, I've worked with a lot of companies that are second, third generation, and they've had these problems for, you know, mm -hmm. decades. But really, um, I think the deciding factor that why people hire me is the pain got overwhelming. And I think the big reason that they hire me over others, and they probably hired others, uh, probably 60 or 70 percent of the time, they've hired what I call the MBA consultants, and they do a great job in terms of, of business models and what to do from a business standpoint, but that's not where our problems are. Those are symptomatic instead of the core issues are with the people. And so I, uh, when I'm sitting down with the CEO or the president for the first time, I'm not selling them on anything. I'm just basically asking, where's the pain? And then once, and then I have a series of about 32 questions in, in four different um, segments. And then I choose two or three of those questions out of each segment. And based on that, I can get a really good feel for what is happening in the organization. And after them sharing where their different pain points are, then I'm able to start telling them about their organization. I don't know the names, but I know the personalities because I've ran this a lot. I know the problems versus the symptoms. And then once we get to that point, then it's like, okay, yes, you know, come in and help us. And we usually start with an assessment. You know, let's find out, you know, really where all the dead bodies are buried and what's truly happening in the organization. And then from that, then we can build, you know, what's the top priorities that we need to focus on. So, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, you were talking about different generations. What about, I'm not going to use the word millennial anymore. Like, like you know. You're not going to use what? Millennials. Oh, yeah, okay. But um, just any pain points in an organization where you have young professionals, but then you also have <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and so you know, not I just not, not personalities necessarily, but age ranges mm -hmm. and differences. I run into that a lot. I'm running into it obviously more now with the millennials, but prior to that, running into people from different parts of the country, different cultures. Yeah. And how I've always approached that is have each party, each group, each individual share about who they are and how they need to be managed. And the more we find out about each other, the stronger we're going to be as a team. In fact, I ran into that, uh, a good story, with two partners. They had brought me in to work. They were about ready to dissolve the company. And they said, well, before we dissolve it, let's find out um, you know, if we can still be, be a partnership. And uh, so I came in, and the first thing I did was have them go back and dissect the decisions that they made. Because after the fact, hindsight's 20-20. It's like, well, you made that poor decision. And getting, having each of them share what they did, the information that they had before the decision, the time frame they had to make the decision, and then actually making the decision. And each time we did that, um, the other partner was able to say, oh, now I understand where you were coming from. And I think we can do the same thing with millennials, is find out more about them and what we need from them as an organization, and then what can they give us, and then find... Um, not an equal point because, you know, a lot of people, well, there's different theories of thought, but, you know, really what we need as an organization and what we need to do to achieve that on a quarterly, monthly, weekly, and daily basis. Pardon? And communication style. Right, yeah. And how they want to be communicated with. You know, I, I like um, verbal. Uh, as all of us know, there's been a lot of problems with emails, with texts. Uh, you know, a, a buddy of mine, in fact, we got in an argument here about six weeks ago, and I had sent, sent something in a text, and he's superly, overly aggressive guy anyway. And so he took it as, you know, this, this huge thing. I'm going, dude, have you ever known me to say that or even think that? And he goes, no. And I said, okay. And I was, that was you projecting onto me. But, um, yeah, I think the, the more we can find out, and that's a good... Um, a good lesson just for managers in general is we often manage people the way we want to be managed yeah. instead of saying, okay, what kind of individual do I have here? And I often ask people, how do you like to be managed? And then this is how I manage and then find something that works for both of us because we have to get things done at the end of the day. It's not like we're trying to just please everybody. But if you understand what they need and then how you can do that, and that's where the learning of a manager comes in. Because, you know, I, I say this to people every once in a while, not a lot, but, you know, people say, I've got 20 years experience. 
And based on who they are and what I've experienced with them, I'll say, no, you probably have three or four years experience that you've been re-implementing for 20 years. There's a big difference there. You know, most people aren't continually growing and stretching themselves. And I think that's uh, where, when I've gone into companies, is, is helping people actually become what we would consider leaders and managers, instead of just, I've been here longer than anyone and I know, you know, the processes better. Those often don't grow us, those will just keep us where we're at, or sometimes, um, you know, slow us down. Yes? So, um, what was the catalyst for you to change from one third to another? I had been, um, I came into this company, they were losing money, and the owner and I, I was the optimist and he was the pessimist. And I told him early on after we'd worked together for about 30 days, I said, Robert, you and I are either going to be very successful because you see the negative side of everything and I see the positive side and that should give us an edge because we're seeing the 360 degree of, of every problem. And at that point, they were losing money, so he said, just do whatever you need to do to get us to make money. So, you know, the first year we lost a little less money, the second year we broke even, the third year we started making money. Was that a car business? No, no, okay. that, was, that was another business. Okay. And um, manufacturing. Okay. Still, it was small, $3 million, you know, two and a half, three million dollars million. Okay. And um, we got to the point where he and I were fighting all the time because and I've read about this, and I've experienced it since then, but when companies are losing money or in pain, they say, do whatever to do that you need to do to, to make the pain go away. And then once you do, then it's like, okay, now I want to go back to the way that we were doing it before. And so that's what happened here, and that's where I really started noticing that it's not about profit margins. The, the way to build companies is through the people, and that's where I decided to go back to grad school, get uh, my master's in psychology, and then say, okay, I'm gonna go out and start helping people learn how to run their businesses from a human and behavior and psychological standpoint, not from a business you know, model standpoint. Okay. I have another question. Mm -hmm. So, um, has it ever happened, or can you share a story where uh, the leadership of the business, they decide to bring you in, or bring you consultant in, mm -hmm. and then it turns out that they're actually the problem? Yeah, right. So, so, and then, you know, having to realize that they're the ones with these issues and treating their staff. Right. So, do you have any stories like that? Yeah, I've got quite a few. There's one. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, that happens quite a bit, you know, and, and that's where I think as a consultant, um, you need to be honest with your client up front and say, you know, you're already surrounded by enough yes people. I'm not that guy. If you want that, I'm not the guy to hire. I'm the guy that's going to come in and, and be honest with you behind the scenes. And yeah, I'm going to piss you off. Um, and uh, there was uh, an organization, a large organization that I was working with. It was about 1,700 people and I had been brought in. I was working my way through the organization, working with, I started out in IT and then I went to HR and then I was going to the admin department. And uh, the, let me see in that. Anyway, I'll, I'll call him president. Um, and he, yeah, so he wanted me to work with this one department, uh, the admin department. And so as I'm going through and doing my assessment, I'd already heard stories because I'd been there on and off for about uh, six or eight months. And um, this one vice president was plagued with an anger problem. And so stress would get high and he would, you know, go off the deep end and and be yelling and screaming at his employees. And so I had to go in and did a whole process there with having him sit with each employee and talk about the problems that they had and start putting the relationship back together. And this is how um, the vice president had hurt these employees. Because you know, a lot of times people with anger, they think that they piss people off by this much and it's really this much. And they don't realize just the look on their face their body language can make people just fearful, you know, because of their past behavior. So, worked on that, and then after about 30 days in, after I had a real lay of the land, I had to sit down with the, the president and the vice president and say, you know, we've got a problem here, this is what's going on, this is what's been going on, this is what we're doing to fix it, but the real problem was you. You knew about this for two years, and yet you let it fester. 
if we would have handled this in the first 30 or 60 days, it would have been a, a small problem. Now we've got a year-long project. We've got probably a few people that we're just going to have to terminate because, you know, when trust has been uh, ruined, it's just so much to put it back together. And sometimes it's best just to, just to let some people go and go through the process of that. Obviously, this was a, a county agency, so a long process. Um, and, uh, but yeah, that's one that I, I made a, about a two-page synopsis, and it took me Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to write that two-page synopsis. And it was earlier in my career, I knew what I had to do, it was just getting myself, um, I guess, prepared to possibly get fired because I'm going to be brutally honest here with this president. And, uh, you know, he was, you know, certain people take things better. He was not the type that took things better, so he was really upset. Um, Truth hurts. Yeah. Uh, right. Pardon? Truth hurts. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we worked through that. Uh, I thought for sure I was going to get fired. There was no doubt about it. but. Um, we didn't work as much. I think I, if I would have been nice to him, I probably could have kept that project going longer. But because of the brutal honesty, it was just too much for his ego to take. And um, yeah, I'd worked there for, like I said, six to eight months, worked in three different departments. And that was the last department I worked with <laughs> in, that, in that organization. So what would you tell uh, our small startups? So we had a, we've had all different types of businesses come through Chico Start. Mm -hmm. A lot of them just want to be, they just want to have flexibility and have their own business, lifestyle mm -hmm. business, no right. employees, that kind of thing. Then there's the ones that think they want to have a big company. And mm -hmm. they get to about 10 employees and they run, go run screaming, you know, mm -hmm. so. Then there's some that have, um, like Work Truck Solutions and Market Fleet who have said, okay, we're going to take this on, and now right. they're up to 80. So as they're in that decision where they're starting to hire their first couple employees, mm -hmm. what would be your advice to, to them in establishing a healthy organization and business right. on the human side? Talk to your good friends first. Um, maybe bring in a, a coach or mentor or consultant that can be brutally honest with you about your strengths and your weaknesses. Ego, I mean, um, a lot of companies fail because of ego. Yeah. And we might call it lack of money. But lack of money, again, is a symptom. The ego is what really destroyed the company. And, and that's hard for people at all levels in an organization. Um, and especially those who have been, that are new, because they're just, they're gonna make more mistakes. It's like doing any sport or any business, um, you're gonna make mistakes. And so being able to have those people around you that are honest, and, um, and then also hire people that are gonna disagree with you. Not, not, you know, not have a conflict, uh, friction-related um, relationship, but really somebody that you can say, okay, I need somebody that's gonna be honest and can handle one part of the business and I can handle the other part, and people that are really gonna be um, adding value on a daily basis. And if you can't do that either yourself or with others, you need to get rid of them because companies at all stages are very volatile. They're, they're fragile. I mean, we can look around and, and think of companies that have been around for 100 years, you know, that are, that are gone. And again, the, you might say that the technology changed. It was an ego issue. They weren't looking ahead far enough and they weren't, they weren't evolving to, to stay up with the technology or maybe to shift into other industries. Some companies have done that well, but the ones who haven't, I think, was a real ego issue. You know, they weren't able to, to hear the honesty from from their, from their colleagues, from their partners, from their employees. And that's really the strength of a company is your employees getting their involvement early on um, and having them you know, help you solve problems. So many people in organizations, they say, okay, I'm gonna make the decision or maybe the five to seven people who are on the executive team, maybe they'll bring in some managers, but very rarely do they bring in the employees. And there's ways that you can do that fairly quick and finding out you know, what is the problem and have the person that's, that's working out in the manufacturing plant have them help you solve those problems there and then you know, get input along the way up. So by the time the five to seven executives are making the decision, um, they're working with real facts. Then you have buy-in. Now this takes longer, but you're gonna get buy-in. Um, and so I think the honesty factor is huge and being able to um, 
have those conversations before you even start or in the early days and uh, being able to hear what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are and become comfortable in that and then to be able to do that with your team as well so you guys are coaching and teaching each other it's called a learning organization uh, so yeah that's a huge one and the bigger, the bigger organizations do you um, help them send out any kind of surveys to employees so they are getting feedback from i i'm not big on just blanket surveys yeah. um <laughs> You know, when I start a project, I will send out, this is what we're gonna do, Kelly, you're gonna see Kelly in the organization. Um, these are our objectives. And, uh, you know, so first you get, you know, again, you do just an assessment. And then after that, um, you know, follow up with, this is how things are coming along, so you keep the employees involved. But I'm usually talking from, I'm talking with people from the janitor on up. And then one of the things that I work with the executive team on is spending just five to ten minutes a day talking to employees so that the, that the executive team are meeting their people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And even in large organizations, if you break that down, you, you know, after, depend on the size of the organization, after a couple months or a year, you can get through where you've, you know, touched base with each employee and you start developing a relationship with that person and that really helps with um, the implementation of all your ideas instead of just a cog in the wheel and that's why people a lot of organizations fail um, because people don't feel involved and so involving them in the discussion in the decision making and then helping them feel like a person instead of just you know a, a disposable um, tool you know so many people and that's why people quit yes so I, I, in the evolution of my business, at some point I went through a class from Dave Ramsey. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're aware of so Yeah, he's a great speaker. Yeah. So his class was basically you know, your employees, you, how to get your employees to act like owners. Mm -hmm. How to get your employees to what? To act like owners. Yep. So, and so one of the things that I really enjoyed was he said that your employees are motivated by one of three things. Mm -hmm. And it could change, but right. at this point they're motivated by money, they're motivated by time off, mm -hmm. which is lifestyle, or they're motivated by um, you know, recognition of awards or you know, recognition of their peers. Right. So those three things are the basics, but there are you know, trickling down things within that, but mm -hmm. out of those three things, what, how are your employees motivated? Right. And then earlier on you were talking about, the question was asked, how do you uh, know or the type of person that wants a large business or you want to tailor your business back down. And I've been through that side. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that if there was a test, mm -hmm. just, and, and then you're right, ego, not only ego, but the other thing I think that's really, uh, that, that being self-aware is that you can ask all the questions or you can take a test, but if the ego's right, right in the middle of that test mm -hmm. or survey, Right. And that's why I'm not big on surveys is, you know, in fact, great story. I, uh, I worked with a company, this was 15 years ago, roughly, and we had brought in um, a new president. The CEO owner, you know, wanted to take her company international. And so we went through the process. Well, I wasn't involved in that process. She hired me after she hired this guy. and. Uh, he had tons of experience um, in the international realm with a large organization. Um, and I saw him give a, a talk, a little workshop on um, employee involvement and how to you know, interact with your employees. And he did a superb job, probably better, far better than I could have done. But yet the next day I saw him reprimanded an employee in front of people and did it just terribly. And he continually did that. And so after a very short time, we had to terminate him. So he knew all the questions to the test. He could do a great job, but he couldn't implement it. He didn't have what you mentioned as self-awareness. And, um, you know, and that's, that's a lot of it. And, uh, yeah, when you're thinking about motivating your employees, if, you, if all you do is give them money, you have wealthier employees that aren't as happy. And so remember, you know, self-interest. 
you know, we're all motivated by self-interest, and our job as leaders is to find out what our employees, what each one, what their self-interest is, and then marry that with our organizational self-interest. Um, and then, you know, if you do that, then they're always motivated. It's not sparingly, or it's not just when you're in the room. It's going to be, um, it's going to be really a burning desire. So you really have to marry those two. But it, you know, in all these cases, it comes back to we need to know about our employees. We need to put them first, us second. And at the end of the day, yeah, you as the owner or the CEO or the manager of a department has to make the choice, make the decision. And that needs to be firm. But before that, you want all the great ideas and you want to involve your people. We have time for one more question. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. That was that was great. Thanks so much for sharing, Kelly. Uh, we, as many of us know, after since the campfire, we have new challenges in our business community. One of which is how do we keep our employees here? How do we keep them from moving out of the area? And it's also impacted the. Um, the competitiveness between for talent between our businesses and so this is a really critical topic in addressing the culture of our businesses and you know how do we engage with our employees um, from the human aspect so mm -hmm. yeah it's really important topics love it uh, thank you for coming to one million cups if you have any ideas for workshops that we're planning please mark them down on the sign-up sheet uh, we have we don't have a cup to give away. So <laughs> next week we will have a uh, cup of the cup of the month club or whatever we're calling that. Uh, we're going to be starting. And yes. Uh, next uh, Wednesday, the Chico Chamber uh, Business Connections uh -huh. is at Oxford Suites, and it is uh, hosted by the uh, Center for Workforce Development. Okay. They have a new program that they're rolling out oh, to. Um, so they're, they're excited about it. Yeah. They have a guest speaker coming whose name like oh, I do. They're like Okay, yeah, so um, and that's a reminder to everybody. Uh, the Chamber is one of our sponsors for One Million Cups. So they do the uh, Chamber Business Connections every week before One Million Cups on Wednesday. So next week is an important uh, one with Alliance for Workforce Development. If you can make it at 7 a.m. at 7.30 at Oxford Suites. And so please, next week, bring a friend, find those hidden startups, and go ahead, Eva. Um, I think next week we're on a student, but the week after that, um, I'm bringing down a um, mixed reality company out of Nevada City, and they're called Augmentor. Um, yes. And so I want to start pushing that now. Yeah, that's going to be a big one. If people are going to want to see that. Yeah. So, um, and uh, there are, there's only, it's two, you know, it's like two guys in the garage, but it's not in the garage. And they have several SBIRs, and, and they are extremely profitable. Um, they're only three years old. Um, and they have, they just won two more this week. Okay. So they're, and they're starting to hire more too now. Um, but I'm also going to be putting them together with other businesses here locally. And that's what's important as well. So where we could just want to be beyond one million cups, but I want to share with this organization um, now that they're coming. So it's like, Mark, I got the calendars. Yay, yay. Yeah. thank you for yeah. that. Looking forward to it for sure. So uh, we want to thank Garden Villa Cafe, Chico Start, thank Chamber of Commerce, Danny Schwartz Consulting, and Kelly for coming today. So we'll see you next week. Thank you.